Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Fusion 360 live stream. I'm Wayne Griffenberg. I'm, on the, uh, I'm, a, I'm a tech specialist on the Fusion 360 team at Autodesk. And today we're going to focus on our new rotary axis toolpath workflow. So we're going to do a deep dive into the new uh, rotary toolpath that's been added to our manufacturing extension and available uh, for you guys to uh, to go in there and do some rotary toolpath work. So uh, today we're going to go through, and I'm, I'm uh, uh, joined by Devin Dupuy today. He's uh, uh, one of our experts, uh, and, and he's an awesome, awesome machinist, and uh, does also the Monday uh, live streams with us. And uh, he's going to be checking some of the questions and answers that you guys have uh, inside of uh, our chat today. So. Um, so feel free, reach out. This is live. You can ask questions. He's there to help you. And uh, we can focus on at the towards the end of our live stream on those questions. Uh, so like I said, today, part of our manufacturing extension is our rotary toolpath workflow. Uh, we're going to go through that workflow. And uh, we're also going to point out some practical examples as we go through today. Um, and uh, at the end, we'll get a summary of, of what we covered uh, during our workflow. So let's dive right in so i'm going to bring up my fusion real, real quick and you may have noticed that we had an april update inside of fusion where we have a lot of new tools that are available uh, in the workspace one of them if you check up in fusion 360 and uh, if you look into the what's new and uh, bring up the what's new inside of your browser let me bring that up real quick so in here one aspect you'll see is a new fourth axis rotary milling uh, toolpath is available, right? So it's a strategy to be able to add to our toolbox of, or shall I say our box of tools of what we can do inside of Fusion. And this adds a simultaneous fourth uh, solution that you can add to your different uh, projects. So uh, mostly for finishing today, it's an extension of our power mill interface inside of the extension. Uh, manufacturing extension that you can use. So um, let's dive in and explore that, right? So I'm going to start from scratch. We're going to work up a model together and I'm going to add some tool paths to it uh, to um, to show out or show you guys how that workflow is. So let's draw something up simple. Uh, I'm going to jump into Fusion and I'm going to start to design. Now, um, I often like to design on my XYZ plane or shall I say in the YZ or why explain. Um, and in here, if I'm doing some mill, I like to do uh, on that three axis mill. Um, oh, can you guys hear me? It looks like my mic cut out there for a second. But so on three axis mill machines, I like to work on this plane. When we do turning or mill turn, I often like to work uh, on this plane here. So I like to work on the XZ plane, right? So we have our X axis normal to the, uh, the, towards the top of our profile and the X axis to the front of the part. We would work in the part back in this quadrant. Now, when it comes to rotary axis on our Haas that we would do, uh, a lot of the rotary tool pass, we would rotate around the A axis, which rotates around the X. Uh, if you remember one of our trainings um, from uh, a few months ago, we, we did the overview basic training. Uh, and then in there, we kind of like gave an overview of the different axes, right? So um, this is just a refresher. And maybe for those of you who may be new um, to machining, uh, we often talk about the X, Y, Z axes, the X, uh, red, green, blue. It's easy to remember that uh, X, Y, Z, R, G, B. And around the X axis, we have the A axis rotary. So if you look at it down along the line of the X axis, you'll see we have counterclockwise positive in most, most machines. And uh, on the Y axis, you'll see we have the B axis that rotates around the Y and the C axis that rotates around the Z axis. We're going to focus on this A axis rotary today. Right. So um, some machines, you can have rotary, of course, around your Y or your Z, which is your C axis. But for the one I'm going to design, it's going to be around the A axis on the Haas. So I just wanted to give you a quick refresher on that. So I'd like to draw 
a profile on the X, Z axis. So in here, I'm going to select that axis. I like to use my right click key and I like to use the quick keys often. So we're going to spend some time today and talk about some quick keys. So if I right click on that plane and go down to create sketch, Fusion brings me into that plane. Um, and I can also see the sketch on our browser, this sketch on our timeline, and it opened up our sketch palette with different tools. So let's start to sketch our profile. So I'm going to start with a actually a rectangle. So I'm going to hit the R key on my keyboard, and I'm going to snap that rectangle and start to drag. Um, this is going to be a two inch diameter part. So I'm sorry, four inch diameter part. And I want to make it a, a two inch radius. And we're going to make it four inches long uh, on this tab here. So I'm going to hit the tab key. Uh, actually, I'm going to type in four and hit tab. And now we have a four by two rectangle. And if I hit enter, it's now that rectangular shape I'm looking for, right? So we have our horizontal and vertical constraints. I'm just going to add a feature in here. We're going to add a circle. I'm going to right click and use my gesture, right click gesture tools. So if I right click, drag down, and I gesture up to, let's say 10 o'clock, I get a circle. If I, if I drag up to, uh, I'm sorry, this is 10 o'clock, two o'clock, I get a rectangle. Down to six o'clock, I get a line. So I'm going to use that right click, drag up, and I get a circle, and I'm just going to attach a circle onto here. So I get the profile of an extruded circle, you know, extruded um, tube, if you will. And we're going to make that a half inch. And I'm going to hit the enter key. So now I have this half inch circle in here. Um, I want to put one on the other side, but I want to mirror it, right? So uh, I'm going to add a mirror line again, drag down, then down, attach a line from the center and down. And I want to make this turn into a construction line. So I don't end up with these two halves of our design. So I'm going to select it and hit the X key selects the construction plane. So now I'm just going to mirror this feature, right? So now I have a quick key that I set up, which is my shift M to bring up mirror. That's my quick key. You can always go up and choose the tools that you want to have as a quick key. So in here, if I select those three little dots, hit the, key, the change keyboard shortcut, you can add your own keyboard shortcut in here, right? So, so now I'm going to use my, my uh, shift M and I'm going to mirror that circle. I'm going to mirror it about the center line. And now I have symmetry in my design. So if I move this circle, you'll see it'll move on the other side. So I'm basically making a roller in the end here, right? So uh, I want to have this dimension from the back, or in this case, the rear of the roller. We're going to make that also a half inch over. And now what I'd like to do is I want to add the um, the center line for the center cut. So this is going to have an ID along here. I'm just going to simply drag a line. Again, I can right click down and then drag down and then get a line. So it's just gesture down, then down, and then you're on the line. I'm just going to start to attach a line across here. And then I'm going to add a dimension. And again, right click nine o'clock dimension. So let's add that about a half inch. So we end up with a one inch. Uh, center circle, right? So uh, one inch through hole. So let's rotate this. So um, what we can do is now we can start to go up and grab right from solid. I don't have to leave the sketch workspace. I could just go and do a rotate. Now I'm going to use my sketch shortcut bar. I'm going to hit the S key, right? And I'm going to start to type in, I want to be able to revolve this feature. So I start to type revolve. I could jump right to the revolve feature select the plane that I want to revolve, and then just simply select the axis. So within three clicks, I'm able to get that revolved part in the end, which is the basis of our roller. So what I'd like to do is now I want to, to uh, set this up in the CAM workflow, or should I say in the, the manufacturing workspace. And uh, let's get some tool pass on here. Before I do that, I often like to turn off our origin. Not that you have to, it's good to see the X Z plane, right, that we're working on, as well as see where the center line is. But it sometimes causes a little bit of a headache sometimes when you go to set up and put your origin where you'd like it. So I'm going to turn off the origin for now. And let's switch over from here to our manufacturer workspace. 
So what I'd like to do is now, um, of course, I can rough this out, right? So we could do some, uh, we've seen in the past that we do have solutions for wrapped toolpaths using 2D adaptive pocket and contour. We also have ways that we can do multi-axis um, positioning as well as multi-axis simultaneous with a, a contour using the multi-axis solution. So today, now we have added, so if you look under multi-axis and if you have the manufacturing extension turned on, which is right up here, you see that wrench adds the manufacturing extensions. The extensions are where our developers and product managers are adding extended capability to Fusion 360, right? So if this is, um, if you wanna add on the ability to do uh, probing and surface probing and geometry probing, uh, as well as being able to do additive, metal additive manufacturing. Uh, we can also do five axis collision avoidance uh, on a lot of your tool paths for multi-axis, as well as being able to do the steep and st shallow strategy that's coming over from power mill and tool path trimming. And I'll show you this today a little bit today. So um, it did, we do now have this rotary strategy added to our manufacturing extensions, right? So, um, and you can learn a lot more from our main website, go in and look for manufacturing extensions and it'll give you a good overview of what it's about. So now I'm gonna add, first I'm gonna do a setup and then we're gonna add a multi-axis rotary toolpath. So in here, the first thing we do is going from left to right is start our setup. And I'm going to bring this over so you can see a little bit better. So initially, your setup, it looks at the way your part is designed, right? So um, if you go from top down and left to right, you can't go wrong, right? So uh, I, I can't promise you won't go wrong, but if you follow that throughout your experience in manufacturing uh, inside of Fusion 360, you'll find your setup to be a lot easier for you, I should say. So if I go from the top down, the first thing, if I want to, I can select a specific machine. You can create your own um, machine um, configuration in here uh, to match the machine that you're running. And, uh, and you can also download, and there's also um, some sample machines in there you could use to match what you guys have. And, uh, and so we can also change our, our manufacturing type. So if we're doing turning or mill turn, cutting, if you're doing any laser, water jet, uh, or plasma cutting, additive, if you're doing any 2D or, or shall I say 3D printing, whether it's plastic or metal, you can uh, set up a machine or uh, do your setup specifically for those types of operations. And the next thing down is our model orientation. So if we look at the way this is oriented, it's, it's set up to match the way we have the part initially in our workspace. So if I was gonna mill this on a three axis machine, yeah, I'd probably wanna come down on the Z and I wanna move in the X, Y axis. And it puts our origin or our datum point right in top of the model, like our G54 is right on top. Now, in my case, I'd like to have my origin right in the center of the rotary axis so I could select that center point of the rotary axis. So our part's gonna rotate around that center axis. Now, it's not always going to be that case, but in this case, my rotary is going to hold onto this part, and we're going to be able to rotate to get that rotary axis toolpath working. So it's better, it's best to set up your initial, initial setup to match the way the part is in the machine and do that here, right, before you start to get into any toolpaths, right? So this is your first direction into setting up your machine. Uh, to setting up your toolpath and being successful with that toolpath. So I selected that box point. We're oriented correctly, but of course we can always change our direction. So if we want the Z axis to be normal to the front of the face of the part and so forth, we can always set up that orientation. I'm going to walk you through this a couple times today. So, but at least the idea is that we know we want to go from top down, select those different aspects of the way we want to set up our part. For our model, it's already selected. This is the body we're going to cut. And then if we have any fixtures, if I have a chuck back here and I want to avoid hitting the chuck with the tool or the tool holder, I can turn that on as well as a fixture. Now our stock is our next tab. So right now we're cut, not cutting this out of a block. I want to cut it out of a, a, um, uh, um, a bar stock that's really close to the size that we're using here. Right, so I'm gonna switch this instead of a relative size box. 
I could use a fixed size cylinder or a relative size cylinder. Now, the difference being fixed size, I could plug the exact dimensions in. Relative size, if I want to use this for different types of models. So if I'm working on, um, if I'm working on models that are like part of a family, uh, let's say I'm going to work on uh, this part is our roller and I want to do a bearing and maybe I want to do a sleeve for uh, a shaft uh, connection. So I can do all those in the same um, setup. So I could just switch our models out. And if you look at the the um, uh, the live stream that Devin did last week, you'll see that how he optimized this with his stock setup. So you could just drop a part in, the stock updates. So that's really one of the powerful parts of doing a relative size um, stock. So in this case, um, initially, it is set up to work around the Z-axis, which is the way you'd normally work in a three-axis machine. We're going to do rotary work, so I want to choose the axis of rotation. And in this case, I'll just select something off of our model, like a face or an edge. And you can see now our cylindrical stock matches the part. And later on, I'm going to show you how to use a stock body. You just check, go down here and say from solid, and we'll be able to use that body. So let's use this for now. We're going to say zero to our radial stock offset, but in the back side, I want to add on some material that I'm going to grip onto here in our chuck, right? So let's say we add an inch and a half onto the back, and of course it adds it onto the front. Um, so the way I set this up, I selected a side of the cylinder, and it looks at it from the front, right? So sometimes it's, it depends on the way you set up your orientation to add more material, right? So I know it says front side and back side. I can go back and reselect, but for now I'm going to say this will be an inch and a half on that side of the model. And I'll show you this in a little bit, right? So, and in our post process tab, we could set up our program number, our name, a comment if you'd like, and if you have multiple works or WCS offsets, but we're going to use this one for now. Okay, so now let's set up our rotary toolpath. Right, so then we have our model set up the way we want it to be oriented. Now, let's go in to do our multi-axis rotary toolpath. So again, it was recently added um, for the April update, and uh, you should be able to find this if you have the manufacturing extension turned on. Otherwise, you won't see this toolpath as part of your multi-axis solutions. So um, let's jump in here. And so what I'd like to do is like, so for, for all of our toolpaths, if you notice, when we go through our trainings and our, our um, live streams, we talk about this workflow for all of the different solutions. We go from left to right. We select our tool, select the geometry, our radii, which is our heights from the center out, our passes, and then linking parameters. So you work from left to right, top down, right? So the first thing we do is we select our tool, and then from the top down, I can go in and select from a tool library. Now, in this particular job, I'm going to use some uh, ball nose mills to get into some of those grooves. But you could use, of course, your bull nose or flat mills and so forth. Uh, in this case, I could start a new tool, but I'm going to pull a tool from a previously created library. So I'm going to expand down my local library. You can see I have a lot of libraries created as we're helping uh, customers and, and even libraries from uh, other workspaces at Autodesk. So we have a, a build space at our um, a Boston lab, at our office at uh, Autodesk office in Boston. We have one in Chicago, which is our maker space for uh, 3D printing, metal 3D printing. And we have also a maker space and it's actually a, a full uh, assembly and workspace uh, at our Pier 9 facility in San Francisco. And we have a Haas VF2 there, and then we have tools that we could share for that Haas VF2. Now, I created a library down here I called um, for another project I was working on was a roller die set. And we're going to talk about this uh, momentarily. But for right now, I created a couple tools that I was using for that die set, and I'm going to borrow this quarter inch tool from that library. I just simply select it, say OK, brings it into my graphics view. Don't get too worried that it's pointing down the center axis of our part. We're going to set that up in, in just a minute. So I'm able to use that tool. If I go back to select, notice now the tool has been brought into our local document. Right now it's called untitled because I didn't save it. But this tool, if I make any changes, if I go in here and edit the tool, and uh, let's say if I want to, uh, I want to change um, the type of tool, if I change the shaft, 
uh, our holder, feeds and speeds. If I change any aspect of the tool and save it, it's only going to be saved in the local document. Right, so if I want to keep those changes, I can copy the tool. I can go back into my local library for my rotary uh, job, my roller die set, and I could paste that tool back in here. Right, so keep that in mind. You could change your tool at the library setting. You can also change it at the local setting of my document, but keep in mind it's not going to populate back to the library. Right, so you'd have to make a copy of it. So, um, so we select our tool, we're going to say, okay, now we have our tool in our setup here for this part, for this uh, rotary tool path. The next step, well, of course, if we go down to the bottom, we'll show you this later. You can also turn on shaft and holder. And this is really helpful, especially if there's places where you're doing a rotary tool path, where maybe you don't have enough flute length. We want to try to use the side of the tool uh, as much as possible, because the tip of the tool, especially on ball mills, uh, generally, unless you have a specific type of tool, don't normally have cutting at the very tip. So we're going to use the side of the tool and the tool will tilt slightly. And we want to make sure that we don't have the tool holder or the, or the shaft hit the material or hit stock. And you could use shaft and holder and you could tell whether you want to trim the tool path, if you want to detect and have it let you know how long the tool needs to be, or if you just want it to stop and fail. Most of the time I'll have it set to trimmed. So if the tool holder, or in this case, the tool shaft comes within that tolerance or that clearance space, it'll actually trim away and move the tool and link out of the way and move it to the next position where it's not going to collide, right? Same thing for holder clearance. So if our holder is going to hit our stock or hit our part, we can have a trim and move away to the next position in our tool pass. So um, it's a really powerful tool to turn on. We're going to leave it off for now, but I just wanted to explain what shaft and holder is doing. So if we go into our next tab, so if we just hit OK, we're going to get a really ugly tool path. Let me just hit OK real quick and just show you, because sometimes you might think, all right, I'm just going to do a rotary tool pass, select a tool, hit OK, and then suddenly you get this wide moves and it's going sideways and I got something pretty crazy on here. It doesn't seem to work. So there's a couple more settings we have to do to get it to work right. I just want to show you this because there's some places where um, there are some tool paths like the uh, adaptive clearing where you could just select a tool and it goes right to town on the model. Um, today, rotary isn't quite there, but there's a reason for this. And let's dive into that reason. So I'm going to go back and edit our rotary tool path. The next step is our geometry. Ah, okay, that explains why it was going all, all around my model and all over the place because, well, it's looking at the Z axis, the way I set up the model according to our WCS orientation. So by default, at least by my default, it's going to set up the tool initially for the rotary axis to be normal to, in this case, our WCS orientation. That's not really what I'm looking for. So we have some options, and if you hover over, it shows you initially that orientation is going to be um, according to your WCS, right? So you see our x-axis, our y-axis, and our z-axis, right? So um, in here, our x, y, and z are according to the WCS of our current um, uh, uh, WC, our, our coordinate work from our setup, right? So the X, Y, and Z, so if I choose, let's say Y, notice it flips according to our setup of this part, not of our orientation. This happens to be the same, but it's of the setup of this part. So if I choose the Z axis, now if I choose the X, that's what I'm looking for. It even recognizes the boundary of the part. Now, one thing to know about this, I chose the X axis. The red, or shall I say orange plane, represents the front the green plane represents the back, right? So if we're looking at it from a point of view along the rotary axis, you can have it approach from the front or back. Now, keep in mind when I selected X, it's looking at this side. Now, you'd think I want to be able to flip that around. Now, the way you do that is you would jump into your rotary axis down here. So now I want to specifically tell exactly where our rotary axis is going to be, right? So if I hover over here, um, this gives a pretty good explanation. And I'm, I'm, I'm reading this for a reason, because I think it's an important aspect for you guys to know 
when you're setting up your rotary axis. So uh, to select a flat face um, to set the rotary axis to be perpendicular to, or select a circular face to set the center radius or as a point that the rotation or the center axis of rotation will run through. What that means is if you go down here and choose rotary axis, now by default, it wanted to make this the front now. If I select this face, it knows the center plane of the rotary axis, just like the X axis. It flips us back very similar to the X axis. Now, one thing to note, um, if you have a stock that has flat faces or if you have a part that has flat faces, this is okay, it, it works really easily. But notice if I go back here and I select this face, it flips the front to, to be normal to that face. If I go over to this side and I select this face, it keeps the front on that face. And if I jump back and forth, that face or that face, which way do you want to approach the tool or approach the part? What do you consider front of the toolpath? So notice when I selected those different faces, it flips the front and back. So if I select X axis alone, it's only going to look at that center X axis, but it doesn't really give us where the front or back are. So um, I think using the rotary axis to set up a part is an easy way, but sometimes you might find like you're working on a statue or something that's not quite cylindrical and easy to select, you might find yourself using setup along X, Y, or Z, and then you can orient that according to your setup, the way you have it in the machine. So um, I think it's an important part um, to understand first, right? And that's why we go from left to right, top down. So this is the way I want it set up. I'm going to say rotary axis. My origin is going to be where I set it up in this origin in the front. And that's okay. That's what I'm looking for. The next thing is now we have this mode where if I want to not cut these two planes, I don't want it to cut from the front face, which is stock front in this case. And I want to cut to the back, which is the model back. You could choose, and I can say, you know, front of stock, front of part, just like you do in most other 3D toolpaths. You can also grab a hold of that plane and move it back. And I want to stay between, let's say, that edge and this edge. Now, today we don't have the capability of grabbing a point in face yet, but I know this is something that's been on the roadmap. Uh, for the future to be able to do. And hopefully we'll see as our developers and product managers are adding and, uh, and, and from your feedback, right? We are a community software. From your feedback, we add those different capability into Fusion 360 um, and you'll see it'll move up in the list of developers to do's. So anyway, right now I can move this and drag it and you notice the numbers updating. I can also choose and say, I want that to be, let's say half inch and it'll move a half inch over. Right, so if I, if I say zero, it'll stay at the model back. The same thing for the front. If I say zero, it'll stay at the model front. So that's really looking at the space between those planes where our toolpath is going to stay on the part. We're going to talk about setting the angular limits uh, in a few minutes as we you know, get further into this. So, um, But setting angular limits like the pictures are showing us, there's a specific place that you want to avoid the toolpath going to you could set those limits uh, between the start point and end point, and you'll see the toolpath will then go back and forth and avoid that area. And I'm gonna show you an example of this uh, soon. So in here, we could select specific model faces that we wanna cut if you want to. Uh, and this is where we can include, there we go. This is where we can include our setup model Right, and then by including a setup model simply means it's going to look at the model from the initial setup and compare that to the geometry that we're selecting. So you can do specific model faces that you want to machine. Right, and also we can avoid specific faces if you like with avoid touch surfaces. So you can select a, a surface that you want to keep the tool normal to or on. And you can also choose, or in this, that's when you choose touch surfaces, or you can avoid specific areas. So if I don't want the tool getting into those grooves that we set up there, um, those will be avoided. And if I want them to only touch those surfaces, I could select touch surfaces and it's only going to go to those areas. All right, so we're, gonna, we're not going to enable that for this job, but I just wanted to show you that you could select those different geometries. Radii. 
You'll see this for most targeting toolpaths as well. So now it's added into rotary toolpaths, looking at where your heights and your clearances would be, your outer radius, right? And we're setting this to our stock OD, so we know we're not going to gouge the tool getting into the material. But you can also set this to any ID off the part. Our retract is how far our tool is going to go in between passes or in between sections of a toolpath. And our clearance area is how far we're cleared away from any fixtures when we move from one toolpath to another uh, in those inst instances. And they're all from the radius center out. Now, our passes tab, this is where we want to spend some time um, to set up our toolpath the way we want the tool to approach it. So right now, this is our step over, and it's pretty standard for most of your 3D and uh, multi-axis toolpaths. You could set this to be how far or, or eliminate those cusps between passes. So in this case, I have a ball nose tool. If I'm going to use the side, and I'll show you this in a second, but I'm going to use that ball nose tool. And as I go back and forth, of course, I'm going to leave cusps between each pass. By leaving those cusps, of course, that's your tooling marks, that's your witness lines and so forth. That's where you want to have the best surface. You're going to minimize those cusps. And often when you're roughing out a part, you want to go from the biggest tool down to the smallest tool uh, to get it most, uh, to get those cusps very small. In this case, we're going to keep this at a hundred thousandths as we approach uh, in the model. We could choose a direction. So if you want a conventional cut or if you want to keep it as a uh, standard um, or, or actually if you want to do a um, climb cut, you could choose back and forth, but if you only want the tool to go in one direction, you could choose, I only want to go on a climb cut, or, or if I only want to go conventional. In this case, both ways will bring the tool back and forth, right? So, um, and then you could choose that. So in here, this is our rotary passes, the way the tool is going to approach the model. A spiral, as you would imagine, it's going to continue almost like a thread Right. So in fact, there's some ways you could use it to help make threads, but I'm not going to walk through that today. But you could do a spiral toolpath working from one end to the, to the other, almost like a 3D ramp in a way. And it's going to keep the tool engaged as it works its way around the part. Right. So we have a line toolpath. Oops, let me get back over there. So the line toolpath is going to go along the axis. So in this case, the X axis, the tool is going to move along that axis and it'll move in percentages or, or in this case in degrees, right? So for each degree, if you set it at one degree, actually, let's change that over. You could set it and say, I want to move it at one degree up here. In this case, it's set for five degrees and you could have it move every five degrees to a line, move every five degrees, come back. The circular toolpath as you would imagine. It's just, it's gonna go around the part. It doesn't do a spiral where it's continuous. It, it's almost like your parallel toolpath around the part, right? So you'll you'll rotate around 360 degrees, then you're gonna move over to the next step over, whatever your step over is. Then it's gonna go around another 360 degrees and so forth, all right? And you can set it up that it goes around uh, 360 degrees, steps over and it goes backwards 360 degrees as well. So you can have it go one way or you could choose both ways. All right, we're going to keep this at spiral for now. Um, the tool offset, this is important because in most jobs, the, if we use a ball mill and we're running along uh, the center axis of the, the line we're trying to cut, in a lot of cases, of course, you're not going to cut with the very tip of the tool. So it's better to use the side of the flute, right, the side of the tool. And uh, this is where you could set that offset up. And the picture shows how it's going to approach the part. Right? And you could choose what that offset is uh, just to keep the side of a tool engaged. So in this case, we're going to do something like our diameter, right? So I'm just going to say quarter inch offset. Um, often I'll keep this within the radius to the diameter of the tool, but it really depends on what you're looking to do and what type of tools you have. So stock to leave, of course, if we're going to come back and do a finishing operation, we can leave some stock behind which is it's going to finish down, or in this case, it's going to rough down to a specific height off the part. We're going to leave some stock behind to come back and clean up. Now, in this case, I'm going to clean it down to the surfaces. And our feed optimization, you'll find this throughout most of the 3D and multi-axis toolpaths, where you can optimize your feed in the material.
right? So um, we actually do have a live stream where we go in deeper into this, and today is not that live stream. So, uh, but to let you know, we do have that option. And of course, our linking parameters are the way that we're going to move into the part and away from the part, <clears throat> whether, excuse me, in between passes or in between tool pass. And, uh, and you have your lead ins and lead outs defaults. All right, so I'm going to say, OK, now we should be set up to be able to get a rotary tool path around this part. Now you'll see the tool is now um, coming in normal to the side of the part and we're working our way over. So if we look at it from this front point of view, you can see we're keeping that same constant step over into the material. Right. And this is our spiral tool path and we can simulate in here. Right. So, and, and in our simulation, I like to try to, I have a 3D mouse and I like to try to keep up with it sometimes, right? I'll slow this down. Not that you guys ever have to do this, but, but um, um, it, it does show the tool actually from the part point of view. So it'll actually show the tool wrapping around instead of the part wrapping around. Um, there is a, uh, a milestone. And again, um, within our, um, uh, if you look into our uh, request for changes, which is our, um, um, wish list, if you will. There are a lot of votes in here for being able to set up the simulation to have the part move and the tool to be static. But today, this is the, the way we, uh, we simulate those different parts. So uh, we can see we're getting a constant spiral rotary toolpath around the part. And there will be some improvements made to be able to control the tilt and the height and so forth. But right now we're able to get that toolpath. Now, one thing I'd like to show you, which is really cool um, about uh, an, a recent update, right? So let's say we change this rotary toolpath. I'm gonna go right click, real click. And uh, instead of going, no, not, I don't wanna loop in the simulation, but I'm gonna edit this toolpath and we're gonna make our, um, our passes a little bit more fine, right? So we'll do something like 50,000 step over. It'll calculate for us and it'll show us those passes. Now, if I look at it from the side, and this is something I think uh, is a great add to the software, um, we've added the ability to modify the toolpath directly in this interface. Now, this is something I know uh, Devin shows uh, on a lot of his demos, and he does the live stream uh, using these tools, but it's great that this is officially added now as part of our latest a April update, is let's say, I don't want the tool to come in here and cut this back face. And of course I can edit the toolpath and move that back, but I'd like to do it right now in this toolpath. I can go up here and modify and I can edit this toolpath, right? So I can edit it in place. I can say trim and I can start to draw in here an area around which I'd like to keep that toolpath engaged, right? So if I move this over, right? So maybe I, I want to exclude that set of toolpath like you'll find this where you have a lot of linking moves that you want to exclude from your toolpath you can add that region and you could say do i want to keep what do i want to keep inside the boundary or outside of that boundary i just drew i'm going to say outside of the boundary and you can also change your shape i'll say okay it'll recalculate that toolpath but it's going to omit those moves that were inside of that boundary and it stops and links right here it's a it's a it's a great update um, that we've recently had our developers are doing an amazing job of adding a lot of those techniques and the capability uh, coming over from PowerMill and FeatureCam and PartMaker um, into Fusion 360. All right, so and it's written specifically now for three, uh, Fusion 360, and you'll see that it will apply to all your different toolpaths you're working with, not just Rotary. All right, and I think that's a great addition. You can also see it added this little pencil icon right here. And if you right click, you could say there's the edit, the tool, and then we have the capability we can go in here and change what we edited as well, right? So um, let me go into here and double click. There's our tool path and we can always change and uh, change the way uh, we did that, um, that update. And of course I can always undo and then change that in the past. So I just wanted to show you some tools that were added. So this is the rotary tool path. And, uh, and let's say we wanted to do more like a cross hatch. I want to go across this, uh, these edges here. I want to finish it up with this tool, but I want to go and, uh, and clear it out by doing a line tool path, right? So um, we have the capability where if you right click on the rotary, you can go up and start a new rotary tool path, of course, right? But an easier way would be to right click, go down and create a derived operation. 
and you can derive a new operation from the one we just created. So in this case, I want to do a rotary operation. So it brought in with it the tool, our geometry, our setup is all the same, our heights and everything are the same. But in this case, I want my passes, and I'm going to change this one to a line. And I could say, instead of every five degrees, I want two degrees. And uh, it'll calculate. So I just created this rotary toolpath um, directly from, I derived it directly from this toolpath. You can see we got those linking moves in here, right? So if I go and edit and find out what was going on there, if I go into our passes tab, I'm doing both ways. We're going every two degrees. We do a linear and I have my tool offset set up on there, right? So now we have it going every two degrees, working its way around. We lift up, come back and go in that same direction, right? So I could probably trim that and get that down to one move. And that's actually what I'm looking for. Right, so, um, but I just want to show you that you can make a derived toolpath. You can do your rotary. And if we want to post this out, I could just simply go up to setup. And if we go to post process, right, in this case, we're using our HAS. We have the next generation control in the HAS. We could jump down here and we can use our A axis rotary, just turn it on, post out the code. Right, in this case, I already have a 1001. We're going to overwrite it. And then we have our code that's going to, well, eventually come up. There it is. Now you can see we start in our initial position A90 and then we get A axis rotary. So we do a quick find next and then we can page through and we can see all the places where it's doing the A axis, right? So let me go to edit A3. That's funny. Okay. And uh, so I'm hitting F3 and it's going to all the places. Now it's actually doing the rotary toolpath right now. That's actually the full rotary up here. And you can see we're getting A axis rotation in those different moves. So it does do that full rotary there. So um, one thing I'd like to show you, and I know um, we're getting close to our time. Um, I actually want to be able to show that limitation, right? So if I go into our rotary toolpath and we talked about in geometry, the setting the angular limits, right? So let's say we had some feature here that we don't want the tool to cut across. I could do something like this. Let me turn on, let me go back to design. We're going to design something really quickly in there, right? So let's say um, in here, I'm going to grab a plane off of here. We're going to construct the plane back here. We'll say something like two, that's fine, 260, something like that too. My OCD won't let me grab an odd number <laughs> in there. So let's say we do uh, two and a half inches. I'm just gonna sketch right in this plane, All right? So um, I like to use a center line here. So I'm gonna project, hit P to project. I'm gonna project that geometry in and we're gonna create a center line right along the center here. I want that to be construction. So I'm gonna hit X. And now I'm just gonna draw in, uh, let's say a rectangle and we're going to use a center rectangle from the center out. And this will be, uh, let's say, one inch high by two and a half inches over. And uh, within that rectangle, we're just going to draw in some object in here, right? So uh, one thing about having uh, four kids is that they're really into a lot of stuff. And I get used to drawing things. Um, and often things like, let's say we, uh, let me go into here, Oop. draw this. There we go. So in this case, I'm going to draw the Batman logo. My kids, um, we actually started to do some 3D printing and my son was doing a lot of, uh, he's really into Batman. And so we started to do like, like different Batman designs like this. And uh, so I got some practice and I got kind of used to doing uh, those operations. So if I want to mirror this, and again, I have my shortcut key for mirror, right? So I shift M. And I don't want to include that middle line. So I'm just going to mirror that geometry about this center line here. And I can go back in here and fix this up, but I want to put that onto our design, right? So um, I'm going to do a quick split this face, right? So if I use my S tool, and I'm just going to start typing in split. And I want to split the face. I'm going to choose this face. For our splitting tool, I'm just going to grab that geometry of the Batman logo, right? So it's closed. And I want to split it to the closest point, which is that edge of the face. And now we just split 
that face. Now, if I want this to be more of like a, um, I want this to be a, a rotary part or a rotary cutout, I'm going to do a press pull. We're going to grab this face. Now, notice when you do a press pull, it pulls usually, if I grab it correctly or if I got the right geometry. It looks like actually because of that one little curve in the corner where it's going to freeze up my my uh, my my um, fusion there's one little corner right there where i'm kind of missing that edge and it can't pull that edge out of the model so hopefully it's going to update and not crash on me because that happens sometimes but uh, i'm able to pull that geometry into the model and we could do a wrapped toolpath to cut that out but my main goal was to be able to show you how you can have your rotary toolpath stop and then start so in other words it's going to avoid this area right so let's say we do that um, my press pull isn't going to work because that little corner there. Let me go back into my etch real quick. And I'm going to move this over just so slightly. All right, so I'm going to take this midpoint snap off of here. I do have that mirror point. Actually, let's do it this way. Let me take this one off. I'm just going to move it so you guys can see it. Right, so let me stretch that over and it lets me stretch this box over. Let me stretch this over. That looks good. And now I'll be able to, and you'll see that the split face updated as well. So now I'm gonna go into a press pull, grab that, and I can start to pull it directly into our model. Or if you start pulling it out, notice it expands with the shape of the model, with that arc. So if I start to pull it into the model, and we go into, let's say, 100 thousands, it's now pressed into the model, but it's always, all edges are pointing to the center. Right, so now if you did a wrapped pocket inside of here, you're going to get a true wrap toolpath. But so my point is that I want to be able to go back into manufacture and I want to avoid that area. Right, so let me just right regenerate these real quick. I'm going to show you how to set up the angle uh, inside of there. Right, so um, let's jump into this rotary axis and we're going to edit that. And now, so in here, I don't want our tool. To just drop right inside of that Batman logo, right? I want to avoid that because I want to do a different type of toolpath inside of there. Maybe I'll make a flat plate in here so when it rolls around, maybe like a cookie cutter, right? So I can make Batman cookies and just use a roller to do that. So anyway, so let's say uh, in here I'm going to edit this. Now in the geometry, I could choose our angular limits, right? And I could choose from point. Now here, imagine if we had a handle on here that we can rotate around. Well, if I select this edge, it gives us that handle. And I can say, let's say um, uh, we're going to go 15 degrees above that normal edge, right? So I could say I want to go full 360 degrees around it. Or perhaps I want to say I want to select an end point, right? To which point? Again, I'll select this edge and I can start to rotate this other point around. Right? And now it gives me that view. Now, the highlighted area is showing me where the toolpath is going to go. So it's only going to stay in that section of positive to negative 15 degrees, that 30 degree span. I'm going to choose flip sector. Now the gray area is the rest of the part where I want it to stay. And if I say OK, you'll see. Um, oh, yeah, this is good. This is a great um catch right here the spiral uh, the definition of a spiral toolpath is the fact that it's got to keep that going 360 degrees uh, as it goes through each pass so the spiral uh, toolpath doesn't make sense to lock it because it won't jump over that area so what that means is i have to choose either a spiral it actually tells you if you hover over um, it'll tell you that the angular limits won't work see up top the spiral style requires no angular limits so i forgot that and that's great the fusion caught that so now i want to change this to a circular toolpath i'll say okay and i could change my offset and now you'll see it's going to limit the toolpath it'll work but it'll stop at that 15 degrees looks like i missed my batman logo there that's okay i can drag that down and make it wider right so let's jump back in and uh, instead of negative 15, we're going to make this negative 20 degrees, something like that. Now it's going to miss that Batman logo. So now it updates, and now my Batman logo is not going to get a circular toolpath on top of it. And so that's how you can limit. And if you look at when we simulate, 
Now let me go up here and simulate real quick, and you'll see you'll get that motion back and forth. So it's going to roll the part back and forth as it does that toolpath, but avoids my Batman area. So that's how the angular limits work. Uh, looks like we have about 10 minutes left. I actually thought I would be ending earlier today, but you know what? I'd like to take us all out to the full hour. Um, one thing I'd like to do is I want to go through a realistic uh, process that um, I had a customer ask me about not so long ago when we, we, we were building up the rotary capability uh, within Fusion 360. One thing uh, he'd like to make was something like this. Um, now, uh, I re we recently, my kids and I, we recently started to work with uh, a 3D printer. Um, Phil on our team um, is, uh, is, is an awesome maker geek, uh, a, a master machinist, uh, just like Devin. And, uh, and so um, he got into this 3D printer and sent over a quick note and said, dude, man, you gotta check this out. It's like, it was affordable. Uh, getting it from a local place. Now, we've been into 3D printing at our office uh, forever. And so I picked one up, and my kids and I have been printing nonstop. And one place we found really quick is a place called Thingiverse. Uh, in Thingiverse, um, there's a lot of cool download models that you can get and 3D print. And I think no matter what it is that you're, you're into, you'll find something in there. Uh, in this case, I happened upon this little tiki head. Uh, which which looks like me when I was younger, when I had hair and didn't have a beard. But um, so uh, I wanted to bring this, I wanted to download it. And I kept thinking, well, what can rotary, we can make this. And a lot of customers have been asking about that. Like, how would I do a statue or something like that in a rotary um, uh, toolpath, right? So, uh, so I downloaded this one real quick. And I'm going to walk through with you guys really fast on how you would do that and set up something like this, even if it's a 3D type STL part, how would you do that, right? So so let's go and uh, download these files. It downloads the STL files right from Thingiverse and it put it into my my downloads folder. So from here, of course, I just wanna um, extract those, fo those files directly into uh, this uh, folder. And now if I jump back into Fusion, you can upload that file to your projects, which is probably the better idea. Um, the only because you have it automatically upload into a project where you want it, right? So you notice I, I opened up my data panel and went into that project to look for it. Uh, I'm going to delete this one out because I was doing it earlier. We're going to do it together, right? So um, let's say I'm going to open that up. It's going to go to file. We're going to open, go to my downloads folder. And it found it in the, the, late, the last place I went to look for it. And uh, there's its, uh, it's the uh, 3D STL file. And, um, and you can bring in files like STL files, step files, SolidWorks, SolidEdge, ProE, NX, CATIA, and of course, Autodesk type files. You can bring all those native files directly into Fusion, as well as standard output like iGIST and step files. Uh, you can bring and open directly, right? So in this case, we're going to open up this STL file. And uh, when it gets into Fusion, um, you can see, well, it's a mesh body. I can go into my mesh tools, and if you want, you can start to edit this mesh, right? So if I want to change his nose and stretch it out or whatever, I can highlight that part and start to, to manipulate it in the mesh tools. And these are going to get a lot more advanced in the coming updates. So keep tuned with, uh, with the way we work with meshes. But so if I wanted to delete that out, of course, I got this big, he's like one of those chocolate bunnies. Right, I just bit the nose off them. That's usually what I go for is the ears. But in this case, that's not really what I want to do. So I'm going to undo. And just to let you know, you do have some mesh tools. But what's important, I want to see how big this thing is. So to see if I could fit it on our machine to rotary cut it. Right. So maybe I'll make it out of wood, you know, for the kids. And so I want to go into inspect and pick a point on the top, a point on the bottom. And uh, realize that um, this thing's 52 inches long. Well, I need a tenth of that. I need it to be a little over five inches to fit. I, I have a six inch uh, space in the rotary table that I have, right? So, so I'm going to scale this down. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's scale this down. So I'm going to go to modify scale, right? I'm going to select this file. Now this one happened to be, and I like to check this, our origin happens to be in a normal spot because a lot of times you'll see it in the middle of nowhere where you could do some tools like this, right? So you can move this around. If we turn our origin on, you can move and you can reposition, right? You can select where you want to pivot it from. 
and you have tools where you could move this around to an axis that makes sense. You can rotate it, right? So you can, you're not stuck with the position it's in. You can do a lot of things to be able to position it the way you want and then put an origin on there, right? So just to give you an idea, um, in this case, uh, I want to be able to, um, yeah, that's where I want it oriented in the center there. Uh, I had it scaled, right? So if I look at the scale now, I can see it's somewhere, you know, within uh, something I could fit or I didn't scale. Hang on, I didn't do it yet. Let me go ahead and do that. So let's go to modify scale, grab this model. I want to have it pivot or I want to have the point in which it's, it's uh, base is, right? So, uh, and I can make this, uh, let's say, uh, point 0.1. All right, so I scale it down a tenth of the scale, and now it's about a little over five inches. And that'll work for me. And if I want to be exact, I can go and and find you know the the, the ratio and then make it exactly five inches and so forth. But I'm okay with that. Now, I'd like to switch gears a bit because right now I'm in the mesh tool. It's looking at this body still as an STL, uh, a polygon type. Uh, of mesh. I want to start working in Fusion, so I'm going to start capturing design history. I right click on the main document, go down here and capture design history. So now as I start to add sketches and different features, you can always go back in time and make changes, right? So what I'd like to do is I'm going to take this plane, right? So I'm in my solid modeling workspace. And in this plane, we're going to right click and start to create a sketch. What I want to draw is the basic shape, like my stock shape that I'm going to cut this out of. Right, so I'm going to start to draw in. I get a circle about, let's say, two and an eighth. So I'm going to plug in two and an eighth. And that's what I'm looking for. If I hit E to extrude, I'm going to hit enter first. Hit E to extrude, and I'm going to start to extrude this model as if it's the stock we're going to use. I want to make sure it engulfs the whole thing. Right, so let's say we did like something like five and a quarter. Let's see if that'll work. Right, so let's say, uh, let's say we did five, 5.3. And that covers it. And I might actually want to put a little bit of material on the bottom. So I'm going to do a quick extrude. I'm going to pull this down to represent the stock. Maybe we'll go an inch longer so I can grip on that part without cutting into the resultant model. Now, notice we now have two bodies. We have our mesh body that we were trying to cut. We have this body. I'm going to call this one stock. And we're going to use that stock throughout our setup. Right. So now I'm going to jump from our manufacturing work or the design to the manufacturer workspace to be able to cut this part out. So in here, again, the same thing we did before is go from left to right, go into our setup, right? And then in our setup, we want to set this up to match the way we're going to work on the part. Notice it gave us our origin right in the front top. Now, again, that's not always the case, but it's pretty handy that I was able to get that origin in the front. And, uh, and so now let's say our stock, and then you could plug in, again, we're gonna say from solid. Now I can just simply select that solid model and that becomes the stock we're starting with. Back here for our model that we wanna cut, I can always expand this down and I could select that STL body inside. It's like having the David inside the block of marble, right? So if you're working like Michelangelo, you can image and you can picture what's happening inside. You wanna remove the pieces that are not the tiki. All right, so now I have our stock set up. I'm gonna leave this on for a few minutes because when I go to do our rotary toolpath, I wanna be able to define some of those features off of that stock body. So the first thing is we're gonna do is select the tool. I'm gonna to borrow the tool we used in the last job, which is that quarter inch mill, right? We still have it in the machine, right? And so uh, for our geometry now, our rotary axis, I'm gonna choose rotary. I'm going to select this top face of our stock. It, it recognizes the bottom of the model that we want to cut. Again, we can move this back and forth, but that's the rotary, what I want to cut there. Now for the model, I want to make sure that our toolpath doesn't think we're just cutting that stock because that wouldn't help us very much. So in here, I'm going to un-include the setup model select the mesh body, and now our toolpath knows that we want to cut what's inside of that stock body, right? And then for our passes, and again, we can set our step over, we'll do something like 50,000, actually, that's 
that's fine. 50 thou will work. We're doing a spiral tool path. My tool tip offset will do a quarter inch. And for now, I want to hide the stock. We're going to say OK. And now we get a tool path. Now, I would check out Devin's video from last week when he did his stock setup. He did a really smart way. He set the stock up to match what he had in the machine, and he just brought a file into that stock template. You could do the same here. So if you cut from, let's say you always use three inch stock and you have 12 inches long um, out of your rotary table, just drag a model in there. Sometimes it's not just so easy, but it's a smart way to work. But notice now we have this little tiki guy. And if we simulate, and I like to look at it like this because he looks evil and stuff. Well, not really evil, but you know. So I'm going to go down here and simulate. And you can see our toolpath is going to work its way around from that initial stock shape, and it's following all those little ridges in our model to be able to cut this guy, right? So, and again, you can make that as fine as you need, do a rough set of passes like this, come back with a smaller tool, and uh, and then maybe even do linear, do the line tool path, and you'll be able to get that tool path working its way around. Notice it's kind of recognizing those bumps in the teeth, right? So it's really about how fine do you want to get the tool path around your model, right? And then come back with another tool in the opposite direction, right? And you'll be able to rough out and finish a nice little tiki head, right? So um, doing STL models, it automatically recognized the model at the end when I did set up my tool path. I just told it. It's an important step in here in a tool path and geometry to tell it your mesh that you want to cut. It won't automatically recognize that because it's not really a solid boundary type model. All right, so that's your rotary tool pass uh, for today. I know we're right at the top of the hour. Hopefully it's been really helpful to, for you guys today to see it and you can use this video, come back and visit. And uh, as you're setting up your rotary tool pass, you can always do, of course, a combination of wrap tool pass, three plus one tool pass to do your roughing around the part you know, pick quadrants or however, and then finish it up using a rotary tool path. All right, so um, stay tuned. Our team has been doing a lot of uh, live streams each week. Um, we have a design live stream tomorrow ready for you guys. Um, and, uh, and as well as the Hangout on Friday, Brad is going to do uh, continue his overview of design, his design uh, on Thursday. And then Wednesdays, you can ch uh, check in on the electrical or electronics workspace uh, with uh, Edwin and Jorge. So each week and all week, you guys will have access to uh, what you can do inside of Fusion and how to make your designs the best designs they can be. All right. So with that, um, I thank you guys. Thanks, everyone, for uh, for for attending today's live stream. And uh, please feel free. And hopefully I know there was a lot of questions uh, in the chat and uh, Devin was there to help answer a lot of your questions. And uh, please keep those questions coming. We still check um, this YouTube channel regularly so we can definitely get uh, information back to you guys. So uh, thanks again. Thanks everyone for attending and uh, hopefully this has been helpful. Yeah, we'll see you next week.